On this episode of Assignment Discovery, travel by chariot from Cairo to ancient Thebes with Ramses the Great. Join Ramses in the Battle of Kadesh and learn why he thought of himself as a god. Then explore the mystery of the exodus of the Israelites and the ten plagues cast on Egypt. Finally, debate whether Ramses was the unnamed pharaoh from the Bible. And stay tuned to find out what's new online from Discovery Channel School. The following program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a service of the cable television industry and your local cable company. Consider this before viewing Ramses the Great, part one. As a class, discuss the qualities of a good leader. What modern day leaders possess those qualities? As you watch the documentary, pay close attention to how Ramses the Great was portrayed throughout his 67 year reign. Then compare your modern day leaders with Ramses the Great. Assignment Discovery now presents Ramses the Great, Part 1. He was one of the greatest pharaohs ancient Egypt had ever seen. The greatest builder, the most fearless fighter, and the father of more than a hundred children. New evidence now suggests that he was also the unnamed pharaoh of the biblical exodus. He was Ramses the Great. Is this the pharaoh who went head to head with the God of Israel? Is this the only face from the Bible that we may ever see? Ramses' monuments stretch from his colossal statues at Memphis in the north to the temple of Abu Simbel in the south. In between, the Nile Valley is dotted with temples, palaces, and statues built by the pharaoh the world would know as Ramses the Great. Ramses waged the greatest battle any pharaoh ever fought. Outnumbered in hostile territory, he fought his way out when those around him were ready to run. Ramses knew how to fight. The only battle he may ever have lost was with the God of the Israelites. If you want to understand Ramses, you have to go to Abydos, the most sacred place in all of Egypt. For thousands of years, pilgrims brought offerings here, 
to gain favor with Osiris, the god of the dead. Today, all that remains of the offerings is the hill of pots, jars, now broken, carried by the pilgrims. Ramsay's grandfather was the first pharaoh of his dynasty. They were a military family, new to the royalty business. So when Ramsay's father, Seti, wanted to show that they were part of the establishment, he built a temple on the sacred ground at Abydos. He assembled the finest craftsmen in the land to give the people this dazzling display that once again, Egypt was great. Seti wasn't just building a temple, he was making a political statement. You can expect great things from my reign. This was Ramsay's father. It was a family of overachievers, and Ramsay's intended to do even better. And he did. When he became Pharaoh, Ramses built a temple so awesome that it would become his logo forever and an icon for all of Egypt. Ramses was only in his 20s when he began to build Abu Simbel. It's in Nubia, past ancient Egypt's southern border. It was a unique project. Most temples were built from blocks of stone, fitted together, and then carved. Abu Simbel was sculpted out of a mountain. New rock cutting techniques had to be developed. Artists were lowered from the top of the mountain on scaffold to paint an enormous grid that served as a guide for the sculptors, who then carved the four 67-foot statues of Ramses seated on his throne. But why build such an incredible monument in such a remote place? There was never a large Egyptian population there that could worship at the temple. It was pure propaganda. Ramses wanted everyone to be afraid of him. Nubia was Egypt's source of gold, and the temple was an awesome reminder to Nubians of Ramses' power. Anyone entering Egypt from Nubia would have to sail past the temple with its four colossal statues of Ramses staring down. But then, if a Nubian stopped to visit the temple, he was met right at the entrance with impressive carvings of bound captives, many of them Nubians. Once inside, the visitor could see Ramses leading the army in battle, the reins of his chariot tied around his waist, shooting arrows at the enemy. It was great drama but it didn't end there. Back in the innermost part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, there are seated statues of the gods, Amun-Re, Ptah, and Re Harakhti. With them, exactly the same size, is Ramses the Great, a god among the gods. Quite an ego, huh? And Ramses didn't stop with just one temple at Abu Simbel. He built a second one, for his beloved queen, Nefertari. They were married as teenagers, and he clearly adored her. Above the entrance to her temple, he had an inscription carved, calling her, she for whom the sun doth shine. Nice, isn't it? In the 1920s, when America wanted to commemorate its great presidents, Ramses at Abu Simbel was the inspiration for Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Even with modern tools and engineering techniques, it took 20 years to complete the four colossal heads of the presidents. Just about as long as it did to finish Abu Simbel. Ramses began his reign with a flurry of activity. Egypt is a vast country, mostly desert, and it's the Nile that makes the land habitable. In ancient times, the Egyptians clustered along the banks of the river. Wherever there was a city, 
it was on the Nile. At Thebes, ancient Egypt's religious center, Ramses built more great temples. And across the Nile, on the West Bank, he had tombs constructed in the Valley of the Kings and Queens. But the real capital had always been at Memphis, some 400 miles further north, near modern Cairo. This is where the business of running the country took place. When Ramses came to power, he moved the capital to an area called the Delta, about 100 miles north of Memphis. Here, the Nile branches out into tributaries, and the entire land becomes lush and green. But Ramses didn't move the capital because of the climate. You see, he was a military man, and it was a military reason that led him to build a city named Ramesse in the north. It was the ideal place to launch military strikes, north to Syria and west to Libya, Egypt's traditional enemies. So he built an entire new city and dreamed of the hordes of treasure he could bring back to Egypt. This may be the city that the Bible says the Pharaoh forced the Israelites to build. Ramses' new city became a bustling complex of palaces, temples, storehouses, workshops, and barracks. Ramses had grown up an army brat, and he was comfortable around the military post. It was from this new city that he would lead his legions to the victories that would make him Ramses the Great. Ramses' reputation as a fearless warrior was established at the Battle of Kadesh. We have more accounts of this battle than any other event in ancient history. It was ancient Egypt's equivalent of George Washington crossing the Delaware. What's great is that we don't just have the written accounts of the battle. We still have the very field on which Ramses fought. The ancient fortified city of Kadesh in Syria was built on a hill. This site has been inhabited for more than 3,000 years. And today, a modern village is still on top of it. You see, Kadesh was crucial for Ramses' plan to control the Middle East. But the city was controlled by Hittites, warriors from what is now modern Turkey. They were Egypt's number one enemy, and Ramses intended to take Kadesh from them. So in the second month of summer, in the fifth year of his reign, 20,000 soldiers followed Ramses out of Egypt. They planned to capture Kadesh and all the territory around it. The soldiers were divided into four divisions of 5,000, each division named after a god of Egypt, Amun, Re, Ptah, and Set. As Ramses rode out in his gilded chariot, with the army stretching for miles behind him, he had no doubts about his coming victory. Ramses had never been close to defeat. Soon Kadesh would surely be his. Ramses the Great was leading the most powerful military force the world had ever seen. They passed swiftly through Gaza, northward into Canaan, up through Galilee. When they entered Syria, they would have seen vast areas of green with wildflowers unknown in Egypt. And in the distance, snow-capped mountains, probably the only time any of them had ever seen snow. Eager to reach his goal, Ramses rose early, put on his battle garments, and led the division of Amun towards Kadesh. Stretching miles behind were the other three divisions. As Ramses neared the Orontes River, two local tribesmen joined the entourage. They told Ramses that the Hittite king, Matwalis, upon hearing that Ramses was approaching, had fled with his army 120 miles north to Aleppo. To the young Ramses, this seemed perfectly reasonable. Eager for victory, 
With only the division of Amun, he pressed right on, right up to Kadesh, leaving his other three legions to catch up. With the arrogance of youth, he had left the bulk of his army behind. Ramses decided to camp on a knoll, where he would have a clear view of the fortified city. The next day, he intended to take Kadesh and all its treasures. It was too good to be true. As Ramses set up camp, his sentries caught two Hittite spies and beat the truth out of them. Ramses had been lured into a trap. Motwalis was waiting in the woods just behind Kadesh with 40,000 troops. As Ramses and his officers made emergency plans, the Hittites attacked. Their charioteers charged out, cutting the lagging division of Ray in half, almost totally destroying it. Then they went straight for Ramses' camp. Chariots were being repaired. Infantrymen tended to each other's tired feet. Supplies were being distributed. Ramsey's pet lion was being fed. They were totally unprepared for what was coming. Breaking through the barrier of Egyptian shields that formed an enclosure around the camp, Hittite chariots surprised the tired troops. With the Egyptian army in a state of confusion, Ramses took control. He cried out, Stand firm. Steady your hearts, my army, that you may behold my victory. I am alone, but Amun will be my protector. His hand is with me. As Ramses rallied those around him, he jumped into his chariot, said a prayer to Amun, and charged. It never occurred to him that he could lose. Surprising the Hittites with his bravery, Ramses saved the day. Marshalling his troops, he charged the Hittites six times. Finally, the Hittite chariots were forced to flee across the river. Mutualis, waiting with his hordes of infantry to move in for the kill, was amazed to see his crack chariot company retreating across the river. One prince from Aleppo swallowed so much water trying to escape that he had to be held up by his ankles to be emptied. A defeat had turned into a victory. Now the right hands of the dead Hittites were cut off and piled up so Ramsey's scribes could easily count the dead. It was only the end of round one. The next morning, it was Ramsey's turn to attack. After several charges, it was clear. The Hittite troops were too well trained and too numerous to be defeated. It was a standoff, but the brave Ramses had achieved a great personal victory. Matualis offered Ramses a peace treaty. Both parties would accept the status quo and agree never to attack each other. But Ramses would have none of it. He merely agreed to a truce. He still had designs on Kadesh. So Ramses and his army marched home to his city in the Delta. It must have been a grand entrance, with Hittite prisoners displayed and tales of the pharaoh's incredible bravery. It's the stuff of which legends are made. Ramses carved the story of the Battle of Kadesh on the walls of all his temples, creating the most detailed account of any battle in ancient history. It was a story that Ramses never tired of telling, and the Egyptians loved to hear it. But soon, he would have a totally different kind of battle on his hands, a battle with the God of the Israelites. 
One of the great archaeological mysteries of our time is the biblical story of Exodus, one of the most crucial parts of the Old Testament. Supposedly, 600,000 Israelites left Egypt, but there is hardly any direct archaeological evidence to support it. And one of the central characters in the story may be Ramses the Great. But did it happen? According to the Bible, the Israelites living in the Delta had grown too numerous. And in an attempt to control them, the Pharaoh was forcing the Israelites to build the store cities of Pitum and Ramesses, where the army supplies were stored. When the Israelites asked for three days off to celebrate a religious festival, the Pharaoh not only refused, but said they would no longer be given straw to make their bricks. Brick making in Egypt is still the same as it was in biblical times. Straw is crucial. It gives the bricks strength and keeps them from shrinking when dried. The Pharaoh was making the Israelites meet their daily quota for bricks. But now, they also had to gather and chop the straw themselves. Egyptian cities were built out of mud bricks, millions of them. Brick making was hard work. An Egyptian papyrus describes the brick maker. He is dirtier than vines and pigs from treading under his mud. His clothes are stiff with clay. His sides ache, since he must be outside in a treacherous wind. He is simply wretchedness, through and through. Just the kind of task you would give to oppress the Israelites. When Moses, the leader of the Israelites, and his brother Aaron, ask the Pharaoh to let their people go, he refuses. To show the power of the Lord, Aaron throws his staff to the ground, and it turns into a snake. The Pharaoh is unimpressed, and his magicians manage exactly the same thing. Apparently, it's the old snake trick that all of them knew. Today's Egyptian snake charmers still know how to do it. They're good showmen, with plenty of razzle-dazzle. But in the end, the trick is still pretty impressive. The snake charmer winds the snake around a staff and the snake becomes immobile, and the head appears to be the top of the staff. Moses must have shown the Pharaoh something just like this. When the snake is returned to the ground, it reanimates and rears up. Watching the casual way the snake charmer handles the cobra, it's easy to forget that this is one of Egypt's most lethal killers. Modern Egyptian snake charmers perform a trick that must be a holdover from pharaonic times. They take a cobra, the symbol of the king's power, and tie it in a knot and place it on their heads so the cobra's head points outward 
just like on the pharaoh's crown. Now that you've seen Ramses the Great Part 1, talk about this. According to the documentary, Ramses the Great moved the capital of Egypt from Memphis to the new city of Ramesses. Why did he do this? Could a modern-day leader relocate a nation's capital? What does this imply about the power of the ruler of Egypt? Now try this. Look in magazines, newspapers, and on the internet for modern examples of pictographs or picture writing. Display these modern glyphs on a poster. Then assign meaning to specific pictures and use them to create a message. To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests Egypt, Antiquities from Above by Marilyn Bridges. Log on to discoveryschool.com for curriculum materials and resources to complement Ramses the Great. Consider this before viewing Ramses the Great, part two. Discuss the role of biblical stories as a part of the record of world history. Why is the identity of the unnamed Pharaoh of the Exodus story such a mystery? As you watch the documentary, note how clues from unexpected places are used to try to solve this mystery. Be prepared to debate whether the Exodus story was about Ramses or not. Assignment Discovery now presents Ramses the Great, Part 2. The final confrontation in the Exodus story is between Egypt's living God, the Pharaoh, and the God of the Israelites, who casts ten plagues upon Egypt. Moses says, I will strike the water that is the Nile with the rod that is my hand, and it shall be turned to blood, and the fish on the Nile shall die, and the Nile shall become foul, and the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water from the Nile. Even when it happened, the Pharaoh was not frightened and refused to let the Israelites go. Remember, the Pharaoh's a god too. Besides, the Nile always turned red during the season of inundation, when the river swelled and brought rich red topsoil. The next plagues, frogs, lice, insects, locusts, boils and hail, didn't frighten the Pharaoh either. They were too much like natural occurrences. So he still refused to let the Israelites go. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. Sounds like a sandstorm to me. The Pharaoh had seen a lot of those and wasn't about to let his slaves go because of a natural occurrence. It's the 10th plague, however, that can't be explained as a quirk of nature. Then says the Lord, about midnight I will go forth in the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Heartbroken by the death of his firstborn son, the Pharaoh finally relents, and the exodus begins. But even after all the plagues and the death of his eldest son, the Pharaoh refuses to give up. In one last move to avoid defeat, he quickly musters his chariots and pursues the Israelites. Now the miracle of the parting of the waters occurs, allowing the Israelites to escape. As the army follows in pursuit, they are swallowed up by the waters. The Pharaoh was finally defeated.
the easiest route for the Israelites to escape to the Promised Land was through an area called the Sea of Reeds. It's still there. In fact, part of the Suez Canal goes through it. This is a marshy area where people on foot might be able to cross, but chariots would get stuck in the mud. This would explain the Bible story. It's not so dramatic, but still a defeat for the Pharaoh. In all, Exodus is a great story, but did it really happen? If there were Israelites in Egypt, and if there was an Exodus, why is it missing from the Egyptian records? The Egyptians recorded many wars and battles on their temples, but if you read the hieroglyphs carefully, you'll find no losses. The Egyptians never recorded defeats. To find records of the Israelites in Egypt, you have to go back to the Bible, to a time before Exodus, to the Joseph story. This is where we'll get our next clue as to whether the Exodus really happened. According to the Bible, an Israelite named Joseph was sold into bondage by his brothers who were jealous of his cloak of colored cloth. Joseph ends up in Egypt and is unfairly accused of attacking his master's wife and is thrown into jail. But Joseph has a skill that saves him. He can interpret dreams. In prison, he accurately interprets the dreams of his cellmates. Eventually, the Pharaoh hears of his ability. You see, the Pharaoh is having dreams that none of his priests can interpret. He's seen seven fat cows being devoured by seven lean cows. But this is followed by seven full ears of corn being devoured by seven thin ears of corn. Joseph interprets this to mean that Egypt will have seven prosperous years, followed by seven years of famine. Based on his interpretation, Egypt's economy for the next 14 years is planned. During the seven prosperous years, wheat is stored in large round-top granaries in anticipation of the impending lean years. When the famine comes, it hits the entire Middle East, and Egypt alone is saved from starvation. Now, the neat thing about this story is that it rings true. It has an Egyptian flavor to it. There's even a bit of evidence for the Joseph story on Sehel Island, near Egypt's southern border. The island is covered with rock inscriptions, and there's one that tells about a seven-year famine, just like in the Joseph story. The Joseph story isn't the Exodus, but it suggests there were Israelites in Egypt. There's one more piece of evidence that something like the Exodus really took place, and it's in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It even suggests that our man Ramses is the Pharaoh of the Exodus. The famous Israel Stella is the only place in the Egyptian records where Israel is mentioned. A stella is a large flat stone erected in front of a temple to announce something. It's an Egyptian's equivalent of the bulletin board. This one was set up by Ramses' successor, Merneptah, to brag about his military exploits. He was especially proud of conquering the Libyans and the mysterious sea people who had tried to invade Egypt. But here at the bottom, he talks about his military expedition to Palestine. He lists all the territories he's conquered. Tehenu is desolate. Hatti is finished. Canaan is plundered. Then he says, Israel is laid waste. Its seed is no longer. Look closely at the hieroglyphs. The conquered territories all end in the hieroglyph with three bumps. That's mountains. It's the sign for foreign country. But not Israel. It ends with a people hieroglyph, a man and a woman. That's because Israel isn't an established country yet. The Israelites were still a wandering band. Remember the Bible says the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before they settled in the Promised Land?
Well, if they were still wandering when Ramsey's successor erected the Stella, that would place the Exodus during Ramsey's 67 year reign. The Stella suggests that Ramses the Great was the unnamed pharaoh of the Exodus. There's one last clue that Ramses was the pharaoh of the Exodus, and it comes from one of his sons. At almost every temple he ever built, Ramses had his sons carved on the walls. He was really proud of them. At Luxor Temple, there's a group of them. The first is Amunher Kepshef. The 13th is Merneptah, who succeeded Ramses and became Pharaoh. That means that the first 12 sons died before Ramses died. Remember in the Exodus story, where the king's firstborn dies? Well, when did Amunher Kepshef, Ramses' firstborn son, die? The answer can be found at Abu Simbel. Inside the temple, Ramses also proudly showed his sons. There at the head of the pack is his firstborn, Amunher Kepshef. He was alive and well when this wall was carved. But a statue of him outside of Nefertari's temple has two tall hieroglyphs at the end of his name that mean deceased. So Ramses' firstborn was already dead when Abu Simbel was completed, just after the Exodus. And we may even know where he was buried. Every tomb in the Valley of the Kings is numbered, and one of the most talked about tombs is KV-5, Kings Valley 5. Ramses built the tomb for his sons who had died before him, just across from his own tomb, so they would be with him for eternity. This is no ordinary tomb. When Egyptologist Dr. Kent Weeks began excavating, it became clear that this was the largest tomb ever built in Egypt. It seems to continue on and on with hundreds of small chambers, rooms to hold mummies, rooms to hold furniture, clothing, and all the possessions that Ramsey's sons would need for the next world. When the investigators began clearing the tomb, they found mummy bandages and bones and jars that once held the internal organs that were mummified. They also found inscriptions with the names of the sons of Ramses. What's really interesting is that modern scholarship now places the death of Ramsey's eldest son at just about the time of the Exodus. Isn't it amazing that this tomb is probably the burial place of the Pharaoh's firstborn son? The son whose death ultimately led to the Israelites leaving Egypt for the Promised Land? All the evidence suggests that Ramses the Great was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. The Joseph story shows that there were Israelites in Egypt. It was written by someone with an intimate knowledge of Egypt. And the seven-year famine inscription on Sahel Island? That shows that famines did happen in Egypt. Then, in the Exodus story itself, we are told that the Israelites built the store cities of Pitum and Ramesses in the Delta. And the Delta really is littered with the remains of Ramses' cities. Add to this, that Ramses' firstborn dies at about 1262 BC, the time of the Exodus, and it begins to look as if Ramses was the unnamed Pharaoh. The Exodus didn't happen exactly as written in the Bible, but it seems as if something happened, and Ramses was right in the middle of it. That's why, when we look on the face of Ramses the Great, we are probably looking at a character right out of the Bible.
this may be the face of a man who may have actually known Moses. If Ramses was the Pharaoh of the Exodus, this would explain a radical change in his behavior. The evidence of this midlife crisis is written on a temple wall for all to see. And this is it. It's the first peace treaty in the history of the world. And it's between Ramses and the Hittite king. It has everything you'd expect in a modern treaty. Non-aggression pact, into hostilities. But the important term up there is that Ramses the Great promises not to trespass on the land of the Hittites, to take anything from it. He's given up Kadesh. For years he fought to keep Kadesh. Why is he willing to give it up now? I think the answer may be in Exodus. Ramses had suffered his first defeat. He'd lost his firstborn son. This may have been more than he could bear. The Exodus and the death of his firstborn and other sons were not the only tragedies Ramses had to bear. Abu Simbel was completed around the 24th year of his reign, and he sailed up the Nile with Nefertari to dedicate their his and hers temples. No king of Egypt had ever built anything like it. Of all his wives, it was Nefertari alone who was his friend and companion. She had accompanied him everywhere and appears at his side in his temple statues. This was to be the last voyage for Nefertari, she for whom the sun doth shine. She died soon after their return to the Delta Palace. The Valley of the Queens was called the Place of Beauty, and there, Ramses built the most beautiful tomb in all of Egypt for Nefertari. His beloved queen was slender and elegant, ready to enter the next world. There she would take her rightful place with the gods. Ramses would reign for another 40 years without the companionship of Nefertari. From this time on, he was a changed man. Never again would he ride out of the delta to lead the army in battle. His thoughts had turned from conquest to building tombs and monuments. With such a large family, hardly a year passed when Ramses didn't bury a son, a daughter, or a wife. To create the tombs for his family, Ramses employed an entire village of workmen, sculptors, painters, carvers, overseers, everyone needed to build a royal tomb. This is the town where they live. It's the equivalent of a modern apartment house. Seventy families lived here, right next to one another. Everybody knew everyone else's business. As a matter of fact, we know more about what went on in this village than we do about any other ancient city in Egypt. We still have the notes they wrote to each other on broken bits of pottery they used as scrap paper. This is Main Street. It's practically the only street. This was the house of Kaha. He was a big shot. He was overseer of the workmen. Come on in. This is the parlor. And over here, we've got his kitchen. And this is where the lady of the house ground the grain. Come on. Because he was so important, he had two sitting rooms. And back here, a real luxury, a column for holding up the roof. He had three bedrooms, and he needed every one of them. He had eight kids. He was an important man. He was in charge of one of the gangs that worked on Ramsey's tomb. There were two gangs that worked simultaneously, a left-hand gang and a right-hand gang. And our man Kaha, he was in charge of making sure that they worked efficiently. Everybody in this village had a specific job. Kaha's neighbor over here was a painter and a draftsman. Over here was Kawi. His title was guardian of the royal tomb. He was in the security business. They all worked for Ramses. It was a tight-knit community. Because they lived near the Valley of the Kings, they were a bit cut off from the other villages. They were so far from the Nile that they needed a laundry service to wash their clothes. And they bartered their skills. I'll carve your coffin if you'll paint my tomb. 
that kind of thing. But the workmen didn't spend much time in the village. They had quite a trek to work, so they couldn't be daily commuters. You can still walk the path they took to work. Imagine them, walking in small groups of three or four, carrying their tools, talking. It was a beautiful walk, and as they reached the top, they could see the whole of the Nile Valley below them. Beneath them, they could see Ramses' mortuary temple being built. Just over the ridge here is the Valley of the Kings. This is where Ramses hoped he would rest for eternity. After 67 years of an extraordinary reign, Ramses the Great died in his palace in the Delta. Ramsey's actual tomb has been the victim of both tomb robbers and severe flooding from the occasional downpour in the Valley of the Kings. But it's still worthy of Ramsey's the Great. The burial chamber is the largest in the Valley of the Kings and probably contained the greatest treasure ever assembled. Ramsey's had 67 years as king of the wealthiest country on earth to gather the golden treasures he would take with him to the next world. This room undoubtedly held treasures far more spectacular than those of a young pharaoh like Tutankhamun. By the time Ramses died, most of the men who worked on the tomb were already dead. Ramses had reigned for 67 years. For most Egyptians, he was the only king they had ever known. When Ramses finally ascended to the gods, Egypt wept. But the mummy of Ramses did not remain in his tomb forever. Discovered by archaeologists in the last century, it was taken to Cairo. But this was not Ramses' final journey. In the 1970s, Egyptian curators discovered that the pharaohs in the Cairo Museum's mummy room were dying a second death. The humidity in the museum had allowed bacteria and fungi to attack the mummies for nearly a century. The mummy of Ramses the Great was sent to Paris to be studied and treated by a team of scientists. When Ramses arrived at the French airport, he received a full military reception, as befitted a visiting head of state. Ramses' mummy was examined by a team of scientists at the Museum of Man in Paris. The X-ray of Ramsey's skull shows teeth that are badly worn, decayed. There's a hole in the jaw caused by dental infection. An abscess around his teeth was serious enough to cause death by infection, a condition that Egyptian physicians had no way of treating. We can't be sure that this is what caused Ramsey's death, but it's a good bet that the great man's last days were spent in agony. Ramses died in pain, a crippled old man nearing 90. But the ancient Egyptians believed that in the next world, he would be restored and young again. I like to think of Ramses somewhere in the west, riding out from the Delta Palace in his chariot, the army stretching for miles behind, setting off for new conquests. And when he returns, his beloved Nefertari is waiting to meet him with a couple of dozen of his kids. And as they gather round him, Ramses tells them of his victories and adventures. There were 11 kings of Egypt named Ramses, but there was only one, Ramses the Great.
that you've seen Ramses the Great Part 2, talk about this. There were 11 Egyptian rulers who were named Ramses, but only Ramses II came to be known as the Great. Look back over his life and accomplishments and determine why he deserves such a grand title. Now try this. Find out more about modern national monuments such as Mount Rushmore and the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial in Washington, D.C. Then design a monument for a local figure who had a great impact on your community. To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests All the King's Sons by Douglas Preston. Log on to discoveryschool.com for curriculum materials and resources to complement Ramses the Great. The preceding program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a service of the cable television industry and your local cable company.